Hey folks, so a week or so ago a user left me a comment on the channel saying something that got them thinking. Even my R7 250 is great today. Now the X50 series R cards are cards that have kind of flown under my radar for a number of reasons, primarily because I'd already bought, tested and then sold an R7 260X when making the video about the GPU at the heart of the Xbox One. And since in European markets at least, cards like the R7 350 and the R7 450 are only available as bundling options for a few system manufacturers, it's not like I regularly come across them when searching online. The R7 250 and the 250X however are a little bit different and came about at a time where AMD were having a little bit of an image crisis, having just made the switch from the HD prefix, for example the HD7970, to the R number 200 naming convention. It wasn't slick and thankfully AMD have now moved away from the R5, R7 and R9 prefixes and just use RX for their entire lineup. Confusion about the R7 250 series cards and the lack of exposure in general generally plays into the hands of a bargain hunter though. As I've mentioned in previous videos, the 7900 series essentially became the R9 280 series, the HD7800 series became the R9 270, and the HD7700 series found itself branded in the R7 260 bracket. So I guess one would assume that the HD7600 series would have been the cards that were branded as the 250. Well, not quite. The R7 250 and the 250X were actually still cards within the HD7700 series, and this confusion over which card was rebranded as what at the low end means that you can pick up cards like this R7 250X, which I've got here today, for really cheap. This one cost me £22, and it's actually considerably less than what I also paid for its HD7700 twin. So what is the R7 250X then? Well, with most AIB partner cards, it's essentially a HD7700 GHz edition, which means we get a core speed of around 1 GHz and the memory clock speed of around 1.125 GHz, which is effectively 4.5. The cards can generally be had with either 1 or 2 GB of GDDR5, and that will sit on a 128-bit bus. The core configuration consists of 640 shading units, 40 TMUs, and 16 ROPs and it has an out-of-the-box performance, roughly 1.28 teraflops. To put that into perspective, the OG Xbox One, its theoretical performance was around 1.31, so it should still technically be capable of gaming in 2017, even if we need to drop the resolution down a little. Like a lot of GCN chips though, it does have a little headroom for overclocking, and the card was able to reach a core clock speed of 1.125 GHz, and an effective memory speed of 5 GHz, now a month or so back I also tested out the green team's crowning jewel in the around 40 bucks used price range, the GTX 750, not the TI, which I bought for about 50% more than this R7 250X. But since both cards have the same amount of VRAM, it should be an interesting test, using our usual test rig which consists of the Core i5-4590 and 8GB of DDR3 RAM, we hopped into the 2013 version of Tomb Raider to ease the card in a little with an older title. If you've seen the GTX 750 video, you'll know that at stock it returns 67 FPS on average and raised to 73 once overclocked. Here the 250X falls about 20% short of that figure, with an average frame rate of 56 FPS. Overclocking does help close the gap on the stock 750, with the averages on the 250X increasing to 67 FPS. The newer Rise of the Tomb Raider now, and starting with a resolution of 1080p on the medium preset, and unlike the GTX 750, the 250X here can't quite manage to hit 40 FPS on average and 30 FPS on the average minimums, even when overclocked. Reducing the resolution though down to 1600x900 and keeping the same settings pushes the averages into the 40s with the lows sitting comfortably above 30 FPS. Sure, we may be having to make console-like compromises, but it's entirely playable and it still looks absolutely fantastic. Crisis 3 now and running through the first chapters of the game at 1080p on the medium preset, but averaged out in the mid 40s, with the average minimums in the low 30s for the 750. The R7 250X averaged out at just under 40 FPS on average, and when overclocked, we've seen this figure creep just above that 40 FPS barrier. Dropping the resolution down to 900p though, 
helped bump the overclocked averages of the 250X to over 50fps. Once overclocked, the minimum frame rate seen on the 250X also matched the minimum seen on the stock 750. Now on to Prey, another CryEngine title, but one that unlike Crisis 3, generally offers much higher performance figures. Here we see the GTX 750 perform really well and at 1080p exceeded my expectations in all honesty. The 750 returned averages in the mid 50s while the 250X was no slouch either and it was in the 40s. In all configurations here, be it the 250X or the 750, the game stayed above 30fps which is a key point. Dropping the resolution down to 900p here yielded huge gains on both cars. On the 250X, simply dropping the resolution down, it added an extra 20 FPS to the minimums and the average frame rate seen. Now these tests here, they're playing through exactly the same section of the game, the same enemies in the same route, and simply dropping down that resolution turned the performance from impressive for a cheap card into genuinely smooth. Now we all know that Doom is a bit of a resource guzzler, and starting out at 900p here, there's not a massive difference between the GTX 750 and the 250X. Both cards at the medium preset with FXAA and 16 times anisotropic filtering stayed above 30 FPS on the lows and hovered around 40 FPS on average. Dropping the resolution down to 720p sees the frame rates jump up. Well, on the 750 at least. Curiously, the 250X doesn't see a massive increase in either the minimums or the overall averages. Still, with either card at this resolution, the gameplay flows well enough and it's more than playable. Although, as you're probably deducing from the results of the other tests, the 250X is perhaps better suited to lower presets or maybe dialing back some of that AF and AA. Finally, jumping into a slower paced game with Skyrim SE at 1080p on the medium preset, with TAA turned on, here we averaged out around 30 FPS and had the average minimums hovering in the mid to upper 20s. Now, dropping the resolution back down to 900p would certainly push those minimums above 30fps, and that would be the recommended settings for anyone trying to play Skyrim SC on a 250x. Now, I've not included graphs for the slew of esports titles like CSGO, but games like that, well, you can still get well over 100fps at modest settings at 1080p, so if that's your poison and you've only got 20 quid or so to spend, you're probably going to be a happy camper with a 250x. So if you're watching this and you've got an R7 250 series card, I know you're going to be sitting there thinking this is such an unfair test, and well you are right, but it's not all doom and gloom. The 750 cost me 50% more than the R7 250X, although the results here, especially at the tax and medium presets at 1080p, might seem quite poor, it really is a case that you're getting a bit more than you're actually paying for. Be it in its HD 7770 form or the rebranded R7 250X, they're cards that were aimed at a budget end when they were released over four years ago, and the fact that it can still play games on medium settings with almost full HD resolutions and compare comparably with what the OG Xbox One and the vanilla PS4 can do means that if you buy one, being realistic with your expectations, you're probably not going to be disappointed. I mean, plenty of people still like their OG Xbox Ones and this card is going to provide you with a very similar experience to that. Now looking at these graphs and analysing frame rates, frame times and component usage is great fun if you're like me, but if you're just someone that wants a cheap card to lock modern games at 30fps and enjoy them, then you could do a lot worse than the R7 250X. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this video, it's a bit of an unfair GPU test I know, but the 750 is such a popular card, I thought it would be a good baseline to compare this budget card to. I've got a few plans for this little R7 250X over the next few weeks, and I may have accidentally bought another one, well a HD 7770GHz edition. But that's a topic for another video, all that's left for me to say is take care, thanks for watching, and I'll see you all in the comment section down below, and in the next video.